All right, we have a couple hundred people in here, which is great. <laughs> welcome, everybody. Hello again. Uh, welcome to How to Drink Wine School number three. Um, for those of you that have been to the first two, this one is going to be wildly improved because we have a worksheet, basically. That's the only improvement. Um, but we did try to um, put together a little bit of just something you can refer to while we're talking about stuff, which you can find in the chat. There's a Dropbox link. So hopefully that works and you guys can see it and download it. Like I said, we'll also follow up with an email that um, includes that and some other stuff just so that you guys have. Um, uh, hold on, let me make sure. Think we're on speaker view. Can you guys see me now? Can you guys see? Hello? Um, so just to make sure that you guys have all of the um, all of the assets here. Can we see? Yes, I think everybody can see. Cool. Um, all right, so Grant, do you also, we have another element here, which is an excellent upgrade. Uh, do you want to introduce our um, yeah. resident Q&A answer? <laughs> so um, I had a hard time keeping up with the Q&As last week and I got distracted, but uh, even better. So it'll come in under my name, but it's not me. It's Cedric Nikase, who is the wine director of 11 Madison Park. So any questions answered by me are Cedric, who is um, definitely very much an authority in the subject of, uh, of Rhone wine, of this producer, and just a great human being all around too. So Next time we'll make sure Cedric actually gets the respect of having his real name inside <laughs> this thing. Yeah. But, um, thank you, Cedric, for joining us. That's going to be a big help. And um, so yeah, so look, if you haven't been to one of these before, what we're going to try to do is just cover, you know, a specific topic today, the Rhone Valley. Um, we have this worksheet that hopefully you can all see and use, um, and we'll follow that. And also, please feel free to ask questions in the Q&A. Like I said, like Grant said, Cedric, our friend from 11 Madison Park, will be in there answering in real time. And we'll also pick some and answer them live as well, just so that we're kind of like having a discussion and working the questions in um, as we go. If you really have no idea why you're here, uh, we'll quickly introduce ourselves. My name is Chris Stang. I'm the co-founder and CEO of The Infatuation. This is Grant Reynolds, partner in Delicious Hospitality Group, owner of Parcel Wine Shop, um, incredibly talented sommelier and all around pretty pretty good dude. Um, dog owner, what else? Uh, That's the dog, week three upgrades. Week three upgrades. That's Stu. That's he old friend. Um, so Grant and I are actually, um, we wrote a book together. It's called How to Drink Wine. This is what it looks like. Uh, it comes out on May 12th. It is a real book. It does not um, sort of fade in and out like that in real life. But um, coming out May 12th, we really just tried to write a book about um, learning about wine and making it a little bit more accessible and hopefully entertaining. Um, and so that was kind of the impetus for wanting to do these. Now that we're all locked in our house, we thought, you know what? Let's try to sort of take some pieces of the book and teach them and um, ideally just get people together and drink and have a good time. So here we are. And thanks for joining us. Um, the Rhone Valley is our topic today. It is one of my favorite places um, from which to drink wine. Um, and it's, uh, there's, you know, there's a lot to cover. There's two different sections of the Rhone Valley, the north and the south. Um, and we'll try to get into all of it. Hopefully, you're all on our email list, um, and if you are, you should have seen an email that focuses on one particular wine um, from the Rhone, which Grant, if you want to pull the bottle, we'll show you. Hopefully some of you have this. Um, you want to talk about what that wine is really quickly, Grant? Yeah. <clears throat> this is a good uh, early evening wine for you guys. So the wine is, um, I don't know if you have the label or not, it's not you're not gonna be able to see it here well, but the yeah, wine that we're talking about, there you go, that's my kitchen, with a, a bottle of Dwayne Wade's wine to the right that I did not finish. Um, <laughs> the, uh, so the wine is <clears throat> sweet. Um, Moncour, that's the just the name of the blend. Um, and Cote de Rhone is the region and what's really important for this wine is that you see the name Shav there. We'll talk about that, but that's the producer. Um, and the producer is, is arguably one of the greatest and most historic winemakers in the world. Um, his name's 
Jean-Louis Chav, and I don't know what the exact number is. Um, Cedric, who's answering questions, may know, but I think he's like the 13th Jean-Louis Chav, which is just crazy. And his family has owned um, vineyards in the Rhone since the, the late 1400s. Um, so Cote de Rhone is, I think it's probably a pretty household name, right? You guys have probably all heard of that. Hopefully you're drinking some of it. Um, but we wanted to talk about this wine because it's a producer from the Northern Rhone that's making a wine from the Southern Rhone. Um, so we figured you can kind of get the best of both worlds within that. And uh, we'll try to break down those differences. So, cool. so yeah. let's, let's get into the Rhone stuff. And then, you know, at the end, we're going to try and talk a little bit about the wine specifically and kind of comparing a couple here, but um, I want to make sure you guys are all following along as well. So if you have the worksheet, we'll kind of start, start there. And that should be at least a good place to, um, you know, follow along as we go. And again, please feel free to ask questions um, as we go. And if Cedric doesn't catch them, um, then, uh, then we'll, you know, we'll also grab them and talk about them. So let's Great. talk a little bit about the region itself, which, um, you know, I was going to show you guys just in case you don't have the reference. Um, let me share my screen again. We'll actually, um, just kind of show you a map view of where we're talking about here. Can you guys see that? Can you see that grant? I see it. Yeah. So I think I have Cornos, which is one of the towns of the Northern Rhone pointed out, but you know, here's the Rhone river. Um, kind of, you know, flowing north-south, at least in this part of France. And, um, you know, like I said, Cornos, Northern Rhone town, and then, you know, you can get down into some of the other areas of the Southern Rhone um, where other wine is made. Like, I guess we'll choose, um, let's say, as you go and I'm just showing you guys how to use Google Maps in case you're not familiar. Um, so this can kind of give you a sense for some of the geography, um, as it sort of runs up and down the river between the north and the south. Hopefully that was useful and interesting. That was helpful. Um, cool. So, so Grant, you want to talk a little bit about the north and the south and what makes them different and... Yeah. Um, so <laughs> the first thing is, um, so you have the northern run and then you have the southern run. Chris is sitting in Hermitage, which is in the northern run. Very beautiful. Yeah. Big old hill. It's a little church there, La Chapelle. And I'm in front of a castle in Chateauneuf de Pop, which is the, the southern run. So <clears throat> the Rhone, um, like the Mississippi, is a, a river that runs north south. And when it starts up in the north, you'll see like Hermitage, there's a bunch of hills and the river kind of twists and turns around. So there's <clears throat> Cornas, which Chris showed earlier is the name of a town. And then Hermitage is also a name of a town. Um, and we'll talk about some of the other ones, but kind of as the river twists, there's a bunch of little areas where vineyards are planted <clears throat> and they make up the Northern Rhone. What's um, to start, what's most important about the Northern Rhone is understanding the grape. So the Northern Rhone is all about Syrah, uh, which we now see all over the world. But if you see like Hermitage on a label or Cornas on a label and it's a red wine, um, then it's 100% Syrah, which is really important to know. And then where I'm at in Chateauneuf de Pop, big old castle there, um, you can see that it's really flat. You can also see that the soil, I don't know if you'll be able to see it there, but the soil is really different. So the Rhone is a really old river and it made all these little differences from uh, from north to south, but the southern Rhone is <clears throat> um, really known for Chateauneuf de Pop and then also for Cote de Rhone, I would say are the two most common wines there. And the southern Rhone is really flat. You can kind of see like over Chris's right shoulder, I guess, how it sort of flattens out. Yeah, there you go. Our, our goal here is actually be able to tell you how to identify different soil types via Zoom uh, background images. That's yeah, exactly this course. Uh, <laughs> no, that, that's um, and so the Southern Rhone, which is um, I don't know, probably like ninety kilometers. Um, what's Nobody that? What kilometer is. I don't. Know, it's called. It's an hour and a half south. <laughs> um, 
of the the northern Rhone, it gets really flat and the wines totally change in terms of not only the grapes um, but also the way they taste is is pretty drastically different so what we're drinking now though is uh um i don't know do you what am i what, do let's you, talk let's sort of yeah. i guess we've talked a little bit about the differences why don't you why don't you dig in a little deeper to the southern rhone before we and we'll kind of head towards okay. the north and talk about the wines but um, I think it's interesting just to talk like you definitely talked a little bit about the differences in, you know, geography and I guess topography, the way that the, um, you know, the regions are kind of like situated and laid out, which is important. But what else is important to know about the differences between the two, especially if you don't know a lot? Because I think once you start getting into like, you know, um, microclimates, then we're going to be getting a little nuanced. But um, yeah, there's we'll, like, pretty we'll significant go, we'll go there. Um, but the, so the Southern Rhone is, <clears throat> Southern Rhone is really, it's huge. It's like 20 times the size of the Northern Rhone as far as the amount of vineyards that are planted. Um, <clears throat> and that's really because it's flat, right? So what they do is it's just sort of like farmland that's covered in vineyards. Um, and so in the Southern Rhone, you have a lot, obviously a lot of wine, but you also have a lot of variation in terms of the quality of wine. Um, so you have down there, Cote de Rhone is like what we're drinking now, um, is the most broad kind of area. So in the Southern Rhone and also kind of stretching a little bit north, you have this big circle, right? And that's called like Cote de Rhone. And then there's all these little towns that kind of throw their name on a label um, within the Southern Rhone, also within the Northern Rhone too. And those are towns like Jugandas and Chateauneuf de Pop are two that you see pretty commonly, which are on our our. Uh, see those on the worksheets. We we try to lay those out so you don't have to try and translate yeah. or what we're saying. Um, and both of those towns, as well as Cote um, the main grape is Grenache. But because it's so big and because it's so vast, um, they have a lot of grapes that grow down there. So one thing about like winemaking in general is that vineyards are i don't know wherever they're like flat um versus wherever they're steep when things are flat this is just if you're growing anything it's a lot easier to grow on flat land than to grow on on steep stuff so um you get a much greater variety of grapes that ripen that just kind of work whereas in the northern Rhone, it's really specific to syrah because that's really the grape that works you were trying to grow to grow any of these other grapes it probably just wouldn't taste that good but in the southern Rhone, because it's so flat <clears throat> so dry and it's so much warmer than in the northern Rhone, as the river kind of like breaks apart into sort of the the uh kind of the flatlands you I'm get I'm just saying it's kind of like there you go um kind of any grape grows down there so in an area like chateauneuf de pop grenache is the main grape but there's like 13 other grapes um that are allowed to be blended into that but normally what you see is you see grenache there's some producers that'll do 100 percent grenache which can be really interesting um but in general it's usually a blend so you have grenache they'll put syrah in there too um which is the grape of the northern round and then you also put more ved but um it's not really about like any specific grape as much as it is just about kind of the overall region when you're talking about cote de Rome because Truthfully, they can sort of throw whatever they want in there. Um, and there's, there's a question just to reiterate, where is the Rhone again? So just to just to show you guys, yeah. um, you know, it's sort of like Lyon is a pretty big city in France, you probably heard of. Um, and it kind of runs up and down the river, almost all the way down. You start to get into the south of France there as you get closer into the sort of Chateau Neuf de Pop area. So um, hopefully that gives you some... out in the pinnacle work, just so we're... What's that? Can you zoom all the way out? Like... Yeah to see like France. Yeah, there you go. There we go, yeah, we're pretty far oh, south. Cool. Sweet. Cool. It's a good place to be. Uh -huh. um, <clears throat> yeah, so Northern Rhone, takeaways right now are Syrah, right? Much smaller, 100% Syrah, 99% of the time. Then down in the Southern Rhone, it's kind of like, I don't know, if they weren't growing grapes there, they'd probably be growing corn or wheat would just look like a big old farmland um and that's 
Grenache is the main grape there, but most producers will blend it in with a whole bunch of different stuff. So what's more important when you get like a blend is really just knowing the overall region because you're not really looking for characteristics that are so specific to one grape um, as you are just to, you know, kind of like a very general flavor. I think we wrote in the book um, that Cote de Rhone is a very, you got that section there? I got it. We said that it was a quintessentially medium wine and we have a great, very, um, very educational graphic that you'll see that demonstrates medium. Well, you, there, wait, hold on, wait. Get I don't it. know. I don't understand how technology works, but wait, uh, no, yep. There you go. I don't medium. know. Buy the book, you'll get it. It's going to be great. It's going to be I'm great. very medium in general. But what we did was we did a little speedometer that sat between Cabernet and Pinot Noir. And then to represent Cote de Rhone, the speedometer needle is right in the middle. And I thought that was creative. So that was all uh, good. No, uh, I mean, it was a collaboration. But I think uh, it, was, it was actually helpful for me, even as we were talking about that, like trying to figure out how to visualize something, you know, um, that's, you know, Cote de Rhone's a great wine because it's pretty broadly appealing, right? It's a, it's a, it's a crowd pleaser, so to speak. Um, mm -hmm. And it's affordable, you know, you can usually find it pretty affordably. So um, that sort of- It should always be cheap. If somebody's trying to sell you a Cote and it's expensive, um, they're out of their mind. It's just <laughs> not, it's not, not the thing. Um, yeah, I think it's like with the right producer and, and we'll talk about that. It can be, I don't know, one of the better values that that's out there. I think this is like 20 bucks. Um, which considering the producer, they make another wine, like their flagship wine is like, starts at like 350 bucks and goes upwards. So um, to get a $20 bottle of wine from someone who can sell a $350 bottle of wine, it's good Pretty stuff. Pretty cool. Um, cool. So, I mean, it sounds like then it, it's probably worth just kind of talking a little bit more. It, you know, certainly when I was, I was getting into wine, I would notice, I would see Chateau Neuf de Pop around a bunch. I'd see Cote de Rhone about, around a bunch. Jugondas is, is a place that you've started to see more of, I guess. I've certainly seen it, maybe because I just know what it is. And when I didn't, I didn't recognize it. But um, these are all pretty, you know, from the Southern Rhone, those are all pretty common places that you'll see wine from in your local wine store or in, um, you know, on restaurant menus yeah. um, as you're perusing. But, um, you know, so you're probably, if you're, if you're relatively new to wine, you've probably seen at least one or two of those places um and uh and maybe you've had wines from those places but just kind of worth pointing out that um that's kind of a good thing to look for and sort of connect to now you know okay that's the southern run for sure um yes yeah, chat enough to pop in particular was like uh, less so today but for for a while there it was one of i think probably france's like most well-known areas um the difference between chat enough to pop and and cote de Rhone, is that the wines um, tend to be even like bigger and fruitier and kind of higher in alcohol. So if you like, you're drinking the shop right now and, and you think it's like medium bodied, but maybe you want something that's even bigger and kind of juicier, um, Chateau de Pop will, will uh, fulfill that for you for sure. And then Gigondas, this is kind of an interesting thing, but I think we're starting to drink like lighter wines nowadays um, than we ever did before. That's why part of the reason why the Northern Rhone, uh, although Syrah is a grape that we think is bigger, but in the Northern Rhone, um, last night I was drinking a bottle of Syrah that was only 12 and a half percent alcohol. So it was like really, really light and really refreshing. Um, I think this is 15 percent. Five or something. Five. Yeah. Um, but you can get like Chateau Neuf de Pop that's like 15, 5, 16% alcohol and it's just really big, really juicy, really jammy wines um, from Chateau Neuf de Pop. Somebody pointed this out. Those are almost always going to be quite a bit more expensive than certainly a Cote de Rhone. For um, sure. And yeah. probably, I mean, they're probably the most expensive wines from the Southern Rhone generally, right? Without a doubt. And that's mostly just like prestige, frankly. Um, they, Robert Parker was really into them for a long time. Um, and so all the like big names got a hundred points and it became just like a status symbol. Um, it's not my favorite area, but by any means, but if you want to like drink that style of wine, I think you can 
get the same kind of pleasure out of uh, out of Cote d'Arone, out, out of most shot enough to pop. I'll go out there and say that. Spend um, 20 bucks instead of 200 bucks. Yeah. And what about, because um, this is actually something I found myself wondering when I was drinking those wines early on is, being that they're bigger wines, the shots enough to pops, do you think that you typically want to drink them a little older? Like yeah. with age? Yeah, some of them, for sure. Um, I think, and we can we can talk about this too, I think both um, Northern Rhone and Southern Rhone wines age really, really well. But the, the ones from the Southern Rhone, probably because they're so fruity and so high in alcohol now, um they're easier to drink when they're young whereas like young coat roti from the northern Rhone um or young hermitage where where you're chilling right now can be really intense to drink um just it can be like pretty acidic and kind of bitter so those wines definitely need need more time but i'd say the southern Rhone stuff they can benefit from time they definitely age well but they're um, easier to drink early on because they're so fruity and juicy, jammy. So let's um, so let's talk Northern Rhone now. Um, this is quote unquote my shit. I love wines from the Northern Rhone, um, and you know, yeah. I mean, what was interesting to me, and this is like such a, um, I think I realized it sort of taught me a lot about wines that I like when I realized that a big part of what I loved about wines from the Northern Rhone was that they're savory, right? That, you know, like that a, a wine can ta have like a taste of olives, which, yeah. which I personally love. And I think that was something that as soon as I was able to kind of identify that for myself, it helped me understand that, okay, wines from this area are probably going to be, um, you know, things that I'll like. So Definitely. Syrah obviously, you know, is a grape that's grown everywhere. Um, but, very specifically, you know, the Northern Rhone is where I guess it originated um, and certainly where the best of best example of it is from. Yeah. Um, that was my like first, I remember it being the first wine that I spelled something other than like grapes or grape. wine. You know, people are like early on, you're like, I don't really get it. I don't smell anything. But smelling like the bacon y kind of smoky black pepper thing in, in a good bottle of Syrah um is i don't know super apparent and there's nothing else like that it's really really distinct to the northern run so let's talk about those regions a little bit more yeah. my, my favorite per i love wines from cornas um specifically but there's lots of great stuff from um all over the region so you want to talk i mean maybe start we start a little bit more with Hermitage. i think that's so in, there's a lot of interesting stuff there um and maybe just kind of touch on like what's you know what's different and what's special about each place yeah so um, we'll start with, with Hermitage. So where you can see like, so Hermitage, if the wine is to be called Hermitage, Hermitage. Has, there you go. It has to be grown just on that little hill right there. There you go. So there's only like a handful of producers. I don't know how many, um, but I don't know, Cedric, you can chime in here too, but there's probably only like three maybe four producers of Hermitage um, that you really would like want to try to hunt and, and uh, that are worth, worth the, the premium. But it's so uh, it's, it, the wines can be expensive. They're super, super age worthy. Um, but the reason why they're so expensive is like, it just grown on that hill. So that hill, like down to your right and then down on the just, other side. I'm just get out of here, you don't need me. You just get out of there. I'm just pointing um around is that that's all so if the wine says hermitage on it it can only be from that place right and then another area which is really i think like super exciting there's really good value and you have producers who make wine on hermitage also make wine on the other side of the river so if you look on the other side of the river you see a hill you see like it kind of looks like a like when you're flying over a golf course um or something where you know you see the very like clean patches of green. Those are vineyards too. And that area is called San Josef. So you got Hermitage on one side, right? And Hermitage is crazy. Um, it's this hill that like kind of does all these, has these like little valleys in it, though it's super small. You can walk around it, I don't know, in like a half hour. 
Um, but all the, there's like all these different soil types. And if you want to get really geeky, there's all these like little sub regions of Hermitage that people talk about and et cetera. Which Dylan, Dylan actually had a question here. How do multiple producers have access to the same hill? Doesn't a single person just own the hill? No, they might own like, so where you see like those stakes are, somebody might own that stake, right? And then the next, or where I'm at, you can see like, this person might own one line of vineyards and then the next one over might be owned by somebody else. And, and that's why those are so expensive, right? Is because they're so, they produce a very small amount of wine and they're amazing wines and everybody wants them. So that's why. Exactly. It's crazy. So that's Shav, it. Shav has um, little bits of a bunch of different parts of Hermitage, but they're not all connected, right? And so he'll have like a little bit over here a little bit over there and a little bit over there. And then in between other people have it too. Um, one thing like this is, you see this a lot in Burgundy now, but Napoleon, that little man, I think my dog is sort of Napoleonic in a way. He, uh, this is how far back we're going, by the way, this is going to be a history lesson. Napoleon, but Napoleon did this thing that we don't really, we don't have here, but what he did is, um, it's an inheritance law. So if you're like, say we're brothers, Chris, right? And I just suck. Like I'm an asshole. I, I don't care about vineyards. <laughs> um, whatever. Like I'm out doing my thing. I don't know, being a shitty French jerk. And um, <laughs> dad dies. No matter what. And you're like, dad's dude. Dad loves you. Oh my God. He's like, you're, you've, you know, you're, you're, I've you're worked my whole life for his approval. For sure. All I want is his approval. Yeah, just stare at him at the dinner table. Um, your, your dad's, your dad's son. And I'm, I suck. No matter what, when dad dies, you get half and I get half. Of the land. Of the land. Yeah. Right. And so what happens then is like, I suck. And I'm like, oh, well, screw my brother i'm gonna sell it to somebody else and then it's this like i don't know things just kind of break apart from there and then if okay. i have two sons one of which who sucks and one of which is awesome and yeah. then i die the same thing happens again and again and yeah, again exactly. and again and french people just don't seem to really like each other that much so there's a lot of a lot of breaking up <laughs> like the wine i was drinking last night it's the same thing it's from um, Cote Roti, which is a, a region that in the, in the Northern Rhone, two brothers, dad dies, one brother sucks, one brother's really good. Now all of a sudden you had like 100% of a wine that was really good. Now you only have 50% and another 50% just doesn't work out. Um, but it's, a super, it's, it's super interesting for all of France. And that's actually why you know, it really does affect the way that you know, wine gets made in that country. Yeah, for sure. So Hermitage, real quick, I just want to make sure people remember St. Joseph. It's like St. Joseph. Good saint. Um, that's the other side of the river there. The wines are literally like a tenth of the price. Over there? Over there. Yeah, I'm, I'm dragging my mouse over there. <laughs> um, and uh, they could be really great. So it's still the same grape. Syrah, often you'll have people who make wine on Hermitage and also make wine on, on Saint Joseph, like your boy, Jean-Louis Chab, the 14th. Um, Somebody asked a question, which is a good one though. So they're drinking a Crow's Hermitage. What, what's, uh, what's that? So Crow's is that little flat area right down there, right? Um, behind the tree, behind the, the steeple. Right there. Yeah, exactly. Um, and so Crow's Hermitage is like, so you have the hill, and then Crow's Hermitage is a really like large region. It's kind of like the Cote de Rhone of, uh, of the Northern Rhone. So it's still Syrah. Um, and it's just that it's grown down there. It's not grown on the hill, but it's the region that really touches the hill most. What's kind of messed up though, is that like Hermitage is this premier region. And then you can literally like take a step and you, your vineyards can be continuous. All right, but wine law like defines specific places. One like line over could be Crow's Hermitage versus Hermitage legally. And you just lost like, I know Crow's Hermitage is again, kind of like San Joseph, 
is way, way cheaper. Um, so Crows Hermitage, like Cote de Rome, is that there's some producers who have really good vineyards of Crows Hermitage. I think we gave you one of them, Alan Grayo. He's got really good vineyards that are really close to the hill of Hermitage. Um, and so you can find really good value if you know some of those producers. So and you'll, see those Mitage, of, you'll see uh, you'll see Alain Grayo Crows Hermitage wines on a lot of restaurant wine lists um, around the country, honestly, just because I think it's a great value. And um, I don't know, what, what's like an average bottle cost on a on something like that? Do you think like, on a wine list? Like, like, I don't know, New York City pricing, like uh, 50, 55 to 65 bucks. Yeah, so like a good deal if you want to try something from that area and not spend a ton of money. For sure. But good on you for drinking um, another Rhone wine. My Crows Hermitage friend out there. That's right. Um, okay, I mean, that's, you know, look, I think those are the obviously the important um, places. I think it's probably good to talk a little bit more about some of these. Um, and we, we skipped this on the Southern Rome, so we'll circle back to that. But let's talk a little bit about some of the producers, because I think obviously that's going to be the next question. And, and there's, there's quite a range and there's certainly a lot of really great high end producers. But I think, you know, like we kind of touched on, there's also some affordable ones. But it also seems like this is an area of, uh, of the world where the wines are getting more expensive by the day. Yeah. No, the wines have definitely become more and more. So like you mentioned Cornas, Chris, and then also San Josef, is that those areas have really blown up in the last couple of years. Um, one, I think because there's like a couple of really good producers. There's also some like sort of natural wine culty stuff going on down there, whether it's um, producers like Alamond and, and Klopp and Cornas that are just amazing people and they make almost no wine. So um, like 15, 20 years ago, their wines were just like everyday drinking wines, but they never, they just didn't own that many vineyards, but they were really good at making wine. And then people caught onto it. And now all of a sudden the wines trade for a lot of money. Right. Um, so yeah, Clop, which is the last one on that upgrade list was the one for me that like blew my mind for the first time from the Northern. And you've probably seen since you've been buying it, like every year, it just, like kind of ticks up a little bit more and more. Um, yeah, I remember I bought I bought a couple of bottles before um, the was it Augustus or August Clap the guy the main guy died just last year I think right. And oh yeah, when he died crazy. it went crazy for a second. Yeah. Um, so those are uh, all. I mean, I think the producers to know list here is. I mean, it's important everywhere, but I think it's super important here because it's it's good to sort of like give you a place to. Yeah. Point yourself to. And certainly San Josef is if you're looking for stuff that, that's value driven, um, you know, it's a good place to start. I'm getting low on my coat drone over here. Um but, one thing, even another example of a producer in San Josef that I saw, Cedric, was somebody else asked a question about producers and he mentioned um Pierre Bonon, which is one that I love that when I, I first put that on there because I didn't want people to know about it. Yeah, yeah. When I first started drinking that wine, I think I bought I was buying bottles of 50 bucks and now it's like three or four times that if, if not more right yeah definitely it's gone crazy and it's just a pain to buy like we get i don't know we just don't get that many we'll get like six bottles if you're cedric and and you buy one for what was once the best restaurant in the world you get more of it um but we never got any gun on love so we would have to buy it from some like like the like to to backtrack the like shitty brother of the wine that's now flipping like wine out the back door we would buy it i would buy gun on from somebody who would buy it from him who would sell it to this guy in paris who i know and then it would end up in new york and all of a sudden the gun on that i bought was like i don't know three four times as expensive um from what he was selling it like out the back door it becomes this little thing that you you, you got to have it but gone's great stuff um we i think that um it's interesting you mentioned the, the natural wine part of this because obviously that's yeah. something everybody's super interested in right now and there's actually a question just about sulfites in general so i think it's worth addressing almost every time we do these just how you think that all fits together i one thing that i always used to sort of say all the time that I found interesting was that 
it always felt to me like part of the appeal with natural wine was that storytelling element where like I've used this example a ton of times where a, uh, a, uh, a guy that worked for us came up to me one day and he was like, oh man, you got to check out this wine. It's these two brothers in Mexico and they don't even know what the grape is. It's awesome. And I remember thinking that like, <laughs> it's ridiculous, but B, it's, there's just something to this idea of the storytelling and of the connection to people that I think the natural wine world has done a very good job of kind of like putting out there and like making sure you, you know that you could discover these stories of these people who are making wine but then in my mind I always go back to that Jean-Louis Chave example of this is like the 15th Jean-Louis Chave and his family it's like arguably one of the oldest family businesses in the world and that's such an amazing story but maybe yeah. one that doesn't get told that much so um what's yeah, like I, what are some of the other natural wine kind of things that are going on in this region or even if I don't know how much of it's happening in the, in the southern realm but I do think it's good for people to know who are maybe like interested in natural wine. Like, how do you kind of connect the dots between the southern rounds, the southern rounds stuff? But I think so. I've had this conversation with Jean Louis because he's someone who like farms organically, who makes very like craft driven wine, right? But because his family and the winery is so historic. Um, nobody would ever call it a natural wine because it's been around for so long and it's such like a, a brand name. But as a winemaker, he is like arguably one of the greatest and most like devote winemakers to making um, wine in like a, a very quality sense, right? So in a lot of vintages, he just won't, he won't even use much sulfur, if any sulfur, right? Um, <clears throat> but nobody would ever call it a natural wine because it's, it's like, it's too, it's too expensive. It's too much of a brand name it's from, from Hermitage. So what I think you see though, is that in the Rhone, a lot of producers for a long time just made wine in like an old school way, which you, what that means is that they made wine um, kind of as if like, that was the only thing they did. They had some vineyards, right? They picked some grapes. They made the wine. They didn't have a lot of money to like invest in technologies. Their goal wasn't to make like a really like commercialized mass, uh, produced. mass product, mass produced product. And they still don't today, right? Like Alan Grayo is a producer like that, that like he, his vineyards in Crow's Hermitage and Hermitage, he doesn't have any more of them, right? So as like the brand grows in our mind, you think they would just buy more vineyards and therefore like get bigger and capitalize on that. These guys just don't do that. Um, can't do it really. They can't, yeah, they just can't. So with natural wine in this area, there's been a, there's, I think there's some producers who kind of more than anywhere sort of fit in both worlds. And I would say like Shav kind of fits in that world. The couple of producers like Klopp from, from uh, Kornos is a wine that like you would call, you could call it a natural wine at like a restaurant that's like only about natural wine. You'd probably see Klopp. You would also see Klopp at like a fine dining restaurant too, right? So the Northern Rhone is this sort of like middle ground of where everything has been so rooted in tradition for so long that the wines are both like kind of natural and also um, not natural for the sake of them being like weird and from Mexico and some grape that you've never heard of. Because that's kind of what happened is like people were like, oh shit, this is this is weird, so it's interesting. But interesting doesn't always like taste good. And if if we're only ever drinking things because we haven't like heard of them all the time, um, then you're gonna lose sight of something that's like, I don't know, I think this wine's pretty delicious. Like simple coteron that's made by somebody really devoted to just making delicious wine, even though coteron is probably like the least natural wine wine it's like saying like natural pinot grigio like that's just weird you wouldn't you wouldn't do that like santa margarita is like you nobody should drink that shit but it's like very much not natural wine right and natural pinot grigio that person should get punched because it's just not like you don't need to do that but i would say like somebody taking a chance to be like i found these old grapes in mexico i have no idea what they are i'm making the wine like cool yeah, that cool. person's trying something different, but um, that is like, that's where natural wine gets a little blurry in that people, I think, 
in order for it to be a natural wine, it's got to have like a weird story from it rather than have it just be made um, in a way that is like natural. Agree. Kind of makes sense. I, I'm sure. I mean, it made sense to me. <laughs> I don't know why not. Um, cool. I mean, one thing I think we kind of left out, and I want to circle back a little bit to the Southern Rome producers because I don't want to leave that out. But um, we didn't talk about white wine at all, which you'll see. Oh, yeah. You'll see in the in the worksheet, we kind of tried to tackle that and just say, you know, obviously you're probably going to see mostly red wines or at least, um, you know, that's that's what's most common, you know, at your wine stores and on your wine list. But um, there are white grapes that are planted there. The most common one is Viognier, um, which is super interesting and like rich and, um, you know, pretty unique, but um, they're around. I don't know if you want to talk about ones to look for or kind of the things you're probably most likely to see if you're out there looking for something. Yeah, I know Hillary kind of called me out on that in a way is that there's a there's actually a lot of Rhone wine. Hillary is our editor in chief who's done a wine. lot of a lot of this work with us who I'm sure is floating around on the on the chat as well. But she's like, what about the white wines? And and that's just because I don't like them. I didn't we we didn't really talk about them. Um it's like no matter what anybody would say it's definitely an area um best served for for red wine but the white wines they can be interesting like viognier is a really it's a weird grape it really smells like perfume uh, it's like super floral and it's really rich and and uh kind of like really what's that I, I don't know if it's true for viognier from this area but one of the things i had i think i the first time I ever had it was in Napa. And I actually, it was pretty early on as I was exploring wine. And it was one of the first white wines I thought was really interesting because I think probably at that point I was just drinking like Chardonnay from California. Yeah. Um, and it's somebody had described it to me as oily, which I, which I thought was true. I don't know if that's true for Viognier from this part of the world, but it certainly yeah. was one of those things where I was like, maybe it's just because it was like heavy in my mouth. It's, it felt true, but. Like you just squeeze some baby oil in your mouth kind of thing. Yeah delicious <laughs> don't do that <laughs> but, but that's pretty much the idea and that's why we were not talking that much about white wine but the white wines from like Cote de Rhone Blanc you'd see it called um, the only real like white wine region in the northern Rhone is called Condrieu um, and those are really expensive because it's really small and it's Viognier too but they're like really if you like Chardonnay you should check them out but if you like like Sauvignon Blanc, like stay away because it's it's just not your thing. They're really oily rather than being really acidic or kind of tart. Um, but Schaub makes some white from Hermitage, doesn't he? Yeah, they, yeah, he does for sure. Hermitage Blanc for a long time, like I don't know, people's tastes have changed, right? So everybody used to drink like sweet wine. Port was really important for a little while. I don't know the last time you had a glass of port, but I haven't had one in a, in a minute really really long time it's like the quintessential wine that restaurants give away they're like hey thank you for coming like let me just give you this shit that somebody bought because we don't know what to do with it um but back in the day port was really important or like madeira were really important they were really sweet wines and so um hermitage blanc shop makes it i think it can be really interesting but it's something that you want to have like only a little bit of because it's so powerful it's almost like it's honeyed, it's really oily, it's really dense. But for a long time, Hermitage was like known for its white wine because the wines were so almost like sweet and rich. <laughs> um, and what about um, blending white with some of the reds? Because that happens in the Southern Rome, doesn't it? Uh, it happens in the Northern Rome. So right. in uh, Cote Roti and in Hermitage, um, everywhere but Cornas, you can blend a little bit of white wine um, into it. It's like a tiny percentage. Um, you can blend some white grapes into it. Um, no, that does not make it rosé. No. <laughs> Most people don't really do it now. They'll put like a little bit. I think like the max is probably in, I think in like, you can blend like 10% of, uh, of the white grapes in, into the red wine. Um, and it and it's really done. Nobody really knows why it's done, but it's done to give it um, aromatics and also to like soften the wine up a little bit. Because uh, the one region that we wrote there, Cote Roti, um, that's an area that like 
you, you can see a good amount um, from the Northern Rhone. So that's all Syrah. Those wines are like really, really rich. Crow's Hermitage and San Josef, the wines are much lighter, but Cote Roti and also Hermitage, um, for that matter too, the wines can be like really dense and really powerful. Um, and so they would blend like a little bit of white grape, some white grapes in it to, to kind of soften it up. Very interesting. Um, yeah. So before we run out of time, we got about 10 minutes left. Um, some people in here were just asking about, I think a couple of things. Number one, it'd be good just to like talk broadly about pairing stuff, even though I think, you know, one thing that you'll find from both Grant and I as we'll, as we do more of these, and if you read the book is that I think, you know, you can certainly pair wines with food. That's obvious to everybody, but at the same time, we like to talk more about pairing wines with situations and, whatever you're happen, you know, happen to be doing, um, like going to the beach or ordering pizza, but nonetheless, it's relevant for reasons. So you want to talk a little bit about broadly, maybe some good examples of pairing, especially because look, some of those Northern Rhone wines are really savory and, you know, mm -hmm. a little bit different than the yeah. straight up fruity stuff. Um, let me fill myself up here. So I think like when you're talking about pairing, what's important to pair is, how like big the wine is with how big the food is in a way, right? So that's why like Pinot Noir or Burgundy, we always talk about eating it with like chicken or vegetables or lighter food because the wines um, in flavor are much lighter and those foods are much lighter, right? So um, classically, and this is the weird thing with pairing is like, we'll throw it out there. We'll be like, you should pair it with like, lamb or like pheasant i'm like cool dude like i'm not at home cooking pheasant right now <laughs> but the thing is is that you know in like this part of the world that's kind of what they eat is they eat a lot of uh meat and potatoes like so to speak and so a lot uh, of game birds a lot of game birds <laughs> um they're just out there hunting and picking grapes but the, uh, the, the, the thing with that is that like Syrah, because it's like, so I think you even get this, like this wine. So the Shav, I hope, um, thank you. A lot of you ordered, uh, ordered the Shav from, from Parcel recently, but it's 50% Syrah and 50% Grenache. And I think you get a lot of the Syrah flavors, right? Kind of tastes peppery, tastes smoky tastes like a little bit like bacon, um, those kind of flavors, right? And so for me, what I always try to do is pair up like flavors that make sense with other flavors. Um, and so I like like Coteron, if we're talking about like, I don't easily accessible American foods, I like it with steak, I like it with barbecue, I like it um, just as like kind of a chilled, if you're having like, burgers or outside grilling you know stay inside outside grilling kind of kind of wine um it's just big enough it's juicy enough that it works really well with like a lot of red meats it doesn't work so well with fish um if you must drink like red wine with fish then kind of the only wine that you should drink is pinot noir because it doesn't have a lot of like the uh bitterness the the tannin that you get in this tannin is a word that wine people throw around and that's just like kind of the dry, bitter, um, rich thing that, that you even get in, get in this wine. So I think food pairing, um, I know we've all turned, turned into, to home cooks, um, for better or for worse, but this is like a great wine. If you're splurging a little bit and you're going to cook yourself like a steak or, um, I'm going to have some, pork tacos a little bit later and I'm going to keep drinking this wine and uh yeah so like meat this is like a barbecue meat southern food kind of wine it also though uh, to answer someone's question on here yes it will pair perfectly with spending the next three months pretending that your blanket is the arms of another human so definitely order that at parcel yes yeah definitely I like that pairing <laughs> um, I've been doing that too but uh it's yeah this is a wine it's high in alcohol so if you're just trying to like hey i want to have one glass of wine which kind of makes me feel like two glasses of wine this is your wine 
Anything um, Southern Roan related to that stuff? I mean, uh, pretty similar. I think like, you know, the thing about the Southern Roan is is if you're drinking like Chateauneuf de Pop or uh, wines. what's that? The big wine. So it's sort of same same stuff. Probably generally applies, right? Yeah, same stuff. I will say if you're drinking Southern Roan, it's hard to like drink that and then go back to drinking something else. Um, in a few months from now when we're we're drinking wine with other people and you might like start out with one wine and then go into another one. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm doing that by myself, but the thing with Southern Run wines is like once you drink that and it's so powerful and it's so big um, that it's, it's hard to like go back to something after that and, uh, you know, really like taste that much. Like if you were drink a Southern Run, this is like, I think more so when people are having dinner in the restaurants about like the progression of the wines rather than the food pairings. So starting like light and going to heavy, if you're just out of the gates going like boozy, rich, uh, Southern Rhone wine, that's kind of, you're going to be eating that or drinking that with whatever you're eating throughout the night. For sure. Well, I think that's basically what we have the time for today. Hopefully that was helpful for you guys. I mean, I, it seemed like the worksheet was a good upgrade. So we'll do more of those. There were some questions about whether or not we can do worksheets on the previous sessions. And definitely, I think we can throw that together for you guys. Um, the best thing to do would be to you know sign up for the wine newsletter that we're sending out every week. I think they're going out now on Wednesdays, I wanna say, or Thursday. I don't know, There's, they're coming out one day a week. I can't remember what days are anymore, but um, so we'll put links to those in one of the upcoming um, emails. I think um, the next email that'll go out uh, will be um, in advance of the next session. So the next one we're doing is Rioja um, and we'll send an email about that very shortly. Um, you can obviously order all of these wines via parcel. They pick up, they do pick up, they're delivering right now, they're shipping across the country, um, hit up grant. And, uh, and like I said, if you, want to, you, if you want to sign up for the newsletter, it's just theinfatuation.com slash wine newsletter. Um, I'll drop a link um, and please do. And, and look, like all the feedback, if you want to shoot us an email, just wine at theinfatuation.com. That's a great way to give us feedback on these that maybe you didn't um, you know, mention in the chat today. Um, but the more feedback we get, the more we can iterate and make them better and hopefully more useful. And we're going to keep doing them. I mean, this is our third one in three-ish or so weeks, and we're going to try and do one once a week. And I think we're just figuring out what's useful and helpful more and more every single time. So the more that you guys tell us that, and the more you, you know, give us feedback, hopefully the better these will be. And um, I don't know, maybe we'll come out of quarantine having learned something. Um, thank you to Cedric, by the way, that was awesome. And that was a big, Cedric, up let it up. I'm reading through some of these. I'm learning something. Yeah. Cedric, Cedric lit up the chat. So thank you, Cedric. Um, one, yeah. just two, two last, or I guess one last thing. Um, I'm going to drop this in the chat, but um, if you haven't yet, so the infatuation is a guy we've been raising money for um, World Central World Central Kitchen, which is uh, Jose Andres's um, organization that's doing a lot of great stuff, feeding people, helping hospital workers, um, and trying to employ people from the restaurant industry, so on and so forth. So. Um, I will, uh, let me see if I can find that link, but if you just go to our website, you can see, um, a, uh, uh, a little mention about it. And along with some of the other stuff that we're trying to do just to direct, um, people's resources to things that can help, especially around the restaurant, food, wine industry broadly. So I just dropped the link in there. Any little bit helps. We're trying to get to $10,000. We're pretty close. Um, even like five bucks is super appreciated. Um, but um, thank you guys. This was great. Grant, you want to say anything else as a, oh, thank you guys so much. This is fun. If before we shut it down and throw in, um, any feedback or anything you'd like to learn into the next few weeks in the Q and A and we'll, uh, we're, we're paying attention. And you to that can email stuff. us wine at the infatuation.com too, if you don't catch it in the Q and A. Cool. Thank you guys. Thanks guys. Next week. Sure.